that you guys are all excited to be back, ready for school, ready for homework, ready for all your assignments and bedtime and hopefully no demerits. Um, but I do want to say on behalf of all the faculty, all your teachers, all your friends, even if they don't say it, it's great to see you all again. I hope you had a restful break. I hope you had the time to relax a little bit, reflect, catch your breath, and get ready for another push. Try to get to see you. Um, as most of you know, uh, will know from Dr. Chapman's email yesterday, uh, we're stepping into the first of our three emphasis weeks over the course of the year. Um, I have the privilege of introducing uh, our emphasis week on diversity. Um, I'm especially excited about this week because it directly leads into Alumni Weekend. Um, and as you all could see as you return to campus, there are signs and emails, notices all over campus about the many events that we will be hosting and the sister and brother bears that we'll be welcoming back to campus. It's a very exciting time for us at the Soyenberg community. Much of my excitement stems from the fact that a good portion of our alumni come from countries all over the world, from states all over the country, cities in those states, uh, from different cultural experiences, faith backgrounds, genders, and home lives. And with all due respect to East Atake and Sunnybrook, the Sunnybrook School would not be the Sunnybrook School without this global representation, without its commitment to diversity. I believe this commitment is rooted in both a biblical and a secular mandate. Biblically, we as followers of Christ are called to go into all the nations and share the great news that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the entire world, rose again and defeated death for our salvation, our salvation excuse me, so that we might be in an eternal relationship, in eternal relationship with Him. I, uh, I personally find the prospect of all that travel going all over the world a little bit exhausting. And so I'm personally glad that we're able to just corral you guys, the entire world, into Carson so I could walk straight here from Johnson. I appreciate it very much. I would argue that the secular mandate to be committed to diversity is also rooted in the idea of relationship. <clears throat> At their most basic levels, all of our institutions, activities, rituals are an expression and or an attempt to better understand human beings in relationship to other human beings or person to themselves. Economics, politics, education, philosophy, the arts, technology, sports, Justin Bieber, the list goes on. And in order to best understand and live out that relationship, it is imperative that we listen to the diverse perspectives from all over the world. The biblical mandate includes and extends upon the secular, but the fact remains, diversity matters. Dr. TJ and I have been brainstorming on how these next few days would go uh, for some weeks now, preparing for this first of a couple of emphasis weeks. Um, but we both felt strongly that the events last week in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Charlotte, North Carolina needed to be addressed. In both the biblical and the secular mandate, the commitment to diversity is rooted in a relationship, and it is quite clear that we have a significantly strained relationship in the United States. For those of you who might not be aware, uh, Charlotte has been engaged in a series of riots and peaceful protests that began after police officers shot and killed Keith Lamont Scott, a 43-year-old black man. Earlier that same week, video footage was finally released of an incident where a police officer shot and killed Terrence Crutcher, a 40-year-old black man in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I actually spent my long weekend in Charlotte and in North Carolina uh, and had the opportunity to spend time speaking with friends who live in that city and in those communities. Um, individuals who work in the buildings that were vandalized and who were told by their bosses to stay home Friday as a safety precaution. Uh, individuals whose offices literally looked down upon the streets that were filled with people late Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, uh, even as recently as last night. Friends who walked in peaceful protest before any violence began and continued to walk after the cameras had turned their attention elsewhere. There is disagreement and strong feelings about whether or not the protests are necessary or helpful. There's distrust. Distrust between members of the Charlotte community and their police officers. And there's distrust between those 
who distrust the police and those who don't understand why anyone would distrust the police. There's hurt, there's confusion, and there's brokenness. These feelings are spread throughout the country, from Baltimore to New Orleans to Cleveland, New York, and as recently as yesterday, San Diego. And we're not going to make sense of all that right now. I'm not even going to try to get into all of the details, all of the points of view, all the conversation. That's not the goal for this morning. That is not. What I would like to encourage us all in during these remaining moments is a potential path toward reconciling what is clearly a strained relationship. A path that is not just applicable to relationships of race or class at a national or international level, but also a personal and communal level here at the Stony Brook School. As I mentioned, we have the world represented here. Some of you had the chance to maybe travel to the city, some of you had the chance to travel to other sides of the country even. When we have longer breaks, you'll be able to go home. And the relationships that are strained here in the U.S. Are, are not unique just to the U.S. And hopefully the discussion that we're going to have right now can be instructive for a couple of reasons. Number one, as I mentioned, the path that I'll articulate now is not just one for black lives, for white lives, for Hispanic lives, for Indian lives. Not just that. It's for diversity of gender, diversity of class. Uh, so please hear me as we begin this week. This is not just Mr. Webster up here talking about how black people struggle in the U.S. That's not it. This is a bigger conversation. Hopefully this also can be a conversation that encourages you, gives you the confidence that you go to a school, you're part of a community that desperately wants to do relationship well, that wants to live out the creeds and the virtues that you talk about in philosophy class that tries to embody the different things that you may hear from speakers far greater than I, Dr. Tijan, Mr. Barber, other guests that we have, and that you'll do so with boldness and with conviction. Um, obviously, it's a, a difficult conversation when you talk about relationship, right? They get muddy sometimes. And sometimes you don't even know how they got money in the first place. And I have found it helpful, always helpful, to be able to ask if it's relationship with a colleague, relationship with a friend, relationship with a girlfriend, relationship with my parents. How did we end up here? How did we get to this point? How did things get so strained? And it's important to ask what the history is of that relationship. What is the history of that relationship? Because it didn't just happen in a vacuum. It didn't just spring up out of thin air. My encouragement to friends that I talk with uh, about these issues in particular, and as I mentioned before, other issues of relationship, both healthy and strained, is to look back at the history and try as best you can to draw a continuum from the beginning to now. And those of you uh, taking your humanities classes and you moved on to European history and American history, you began to have some dialogue about, at least here in the States, again, using this as an example, here in the States, how things started here with our racial and class relationships. Obviously, slavery in its very vicious, deeply embedded, persistent form helped build the foundation that we stand upon here in the United States. And it's very difficult to sometimes talk about that. I feel like it makes sense, as with other relationships. You don't really want to get into that part, but it's necessary to do to move forward. And so you may, in your classes, have talked about the fact that millions of Africans were brought over to the United States and then forced to not just work, but to be separated from family, separated from friends, separated from children, separated from identity. And as you move forward, you'll eventually hear about some of the steps that were taken to change that experience, right? We'll race forward to the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, and we'll have a quick discussion about that, and you'll be able to say, this is what President Lincoln said about this, and this is what Frederick Douglass said about that, and then we were good. With hope, thankfully, thankfully because you guys have excellent teachers, you'll then talk about 
Reconstruction. You'll talk about the transition point between slavery being prohibited and then actually living that out. You'll move through sharecroppers. You'll move through all of the experiences that the individuals had. How do, we, how do I live now? How do I change this new experience? And then you'll race forward again from 1865 all the way through Jim Crow, all the way segregation where, and it, I know you do it in his class, you don't really want to think about it, there was a point in time where, based on the color of someone's skin, they could not drink water from a certain place, they could not go to the bathroom in a certain area, they could not get food from a certain restaurant. And then you'll hear big name drop, Dr. King. Woo. You'll hear civil rights. And we'll breathe a deep sigh of relief. And we'll say, thank God for that. And then things get a little bit confusing. We don't really have a ton of concrete things to talk about that transition. We can't, it's almost like we go from 1965 to today. And that's part of the confusion, right? That's part of the lack of understanding, the hurt, the brokenness that I alluded to before. We have a little gap in our history. And when we have that gap, it's difficult to understand how we still have strained relationship. We have a difficult time understanding the role that police played during the Civil Rights Movement. We have a difficult time understanding the opposition to the Civil Rights Movement. When we stand here and look back on it, we say, of course, it would make sense for people to stand up against what's clearly unjust, what's clearly not right. And yet, in that time and place, it wasn't that clear. And unfortunately, not only did police stand in opposition, not only did other politicians and leaders of community stand in opposition, sometimes fellow believers either stood in direct opposition or stood silently. Hopefully we move forward past that point and we talk a little bit about some of the impact that segregation Jim Crow had. And again, I won't dive too deep into the topics of mass incarceration. I won't dive too deeply into the areas of poverty to dive too deeply into those things. I move forward to a more personal experience. In 1985, my parents were trying to get married. They met in a church in Brooklyn, and they came to the pastor at the church in which they met and said, hey, we want to get married. For those of you who don't know, my dad is born and raised in Jamaica. He's a black man. My mom was born and raised in Brooklyn. She is a white woman. And the pastor was concerned about the social implications, the backlash that she would have if she were to marry these two Christians. This was 1985. And then you might say, well, that's 1985, that's different now, different now. Um, one of my best friends, probably he's my best friend, called him Big Brother. About 12 years ago, he was in a relationship <laughs> with a woman. He, born and raised in Liberia, a black man. She, when I was raised in Pennsylvania, white woman. This is 2005. Knew her from the church. Pastor from the church was her father. Loved my friend. Thought he was the best. But when they came into a relationship and wanted to move forward, didn't think it was right in the eyes of God. History is important. As recently as yesterday, and I'm sure you guys have heard about some of the protests that have gone on. Protesting was a very American thing. We literally built on protest. It's what we do, it's what we're best at, I would argue. Uh, there's a football player, plays for the University of Nebraska, he's a linebacker. He and a teammate of his took a kneel, knelt during the national anthem, and again, we're not gonna go down the different paths about whether or not it's right, about whether or not it's just. We're talking about history. And that's two days ago, this is the history of two days ago. And he shared some of the responses that he got from other fans of the Nebraska team, not, not even opposition, other fans, who said that if he didn't like being here in the country, he should go back to Africa. That both he and his teammates who participated in this action were niggers. That he and his teammate who participated in this action should be hung by the flag that they're disrespecting. This was two days ago. History is important. And the reason history is important is that sometimes we are not close enough, we're not proximate enough, if I can use that language, to truly empathize with a situation, right? 
when we're in a relationship again, it's important to know how I got to this point. Personally, corporately, nationally, internationally. And once I know that history, I can then move on to better empathize. Because if I don't know, how could I feel? If I don't know, how could I recognize myself and the other? And unfortunately, we don't do a great job of empathy. Very quickly, both believers and unbelievers, we want to win an argument. I want to be able to tell you that you are wrong and I am right. I heard a phrase a couple of weeks ago that I have been repeating ad nauseum, both as a challenge to others and most importantly, a challenge to myself. You must respect the body you want to change. You must respect the body you want to change. You know, we come here and I listen, this is one of the things I'm most thankful for in my education from Stony Brook, from undergrad, from grad school, is that we can sit down, we can have a lengthy debate, and I'll drop facts. Hashtag facts. And you guys get really good at it. You guys get really good at organizing those ideas and those thoughts. And I want to encourage you to think about the way in which you might talk, hopefully, you talk to someone that you truly love. Those in the room who are married, those in the room that have kids, you know this. Sometimes it's said jokingly, sometimes it's said very seriously. But it's not always the best thing to be right. It is always the best thing to be loving. It's not always the best thing to be right. It is always the best thing to be loving. How we communicate with each other will display exactly how we feel about a particular body, ourselves, one-on-one -on -one relationship, the body of believers, the body of America, the body of the world, and your place in it. Respect the body you want to change, and it will dictate the language that you use, the tones that you share, and the effort that you put in. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, a lack of history can sometimes make it difficult to empathize. A lack of proximity can also make it difficult to empathize. There's so many things that go on day to day that, you know, sometimes as we sit here, so everybody can sit here safely, and I mean that in many different ways. Inside these walls, inside this campus, it's very, very difficult to draw a connection between what's going on and the outside world. This is almost like a safe haven. And yet, as I mentioned before, as I started this conversation, the world is represented here. A couple weeks ago, I was talking to that big brother I mentioned before. He had informed me that there was a, a, another death um, of an African-American teenager um, in a police shooting. Uh, this gentleman's name was Tyreek King. And he told me this about five minutes before first lunch. And I'm walking over to first lunch with tears in my eyes because this 13-year-old boy was dead, and I'm about to go sit down and have lunch with a bunch of 13-year-olds. And I thought to myself that there's so many of us and so many times, even I, forget what other things happen in the world. And again, this is not just about the United States. It's not just about this. There are terrible things that happen all over the world. But we have to empathize. We have to do that. And it pained me to sit down. And I, was, I, I, I wasn't right. I didn't feel right. I felt like the young ladies who were very, very gracious to me felt that. They, they maybe didn't know why, but they felt it. And we all feel it in different moments. And sometimes we don't take it, the opportunity that we have to be in deeper relationship, to ask those tougher questions. Because I know I didn't feel safe, or if it, if it was even appropriate for me to bring that up, to talk about that hurt, to talk about that confusion. There are members of this community right now who may have that similar experience, who may look at the news and see an individual who looks just like them, who's from where they're from, and yet they don't feel comfortable to, to share those thoughts, to fully be themselves. And we have to ask ourselves as believers, we have to ask ourselves as members of this community, how are we doing relationship well? Are we empathizing well? 
you know, um, some of you may be familiar with all the things that are going on. You may have heard it in the news, you may have had conversations with your parents. You may even have your own thoughts about it. And you may feel very strongly about those things. But I believe we're called, not just, not just to empathize, but to identify, right? Throughout the Bible, we're called love your neighbor as yourself. Repeatedly, we see Christ, we see God, both Old and New Testament, identifying with the marginalized, identifying with the poor, identifying with those in which society wants no part of. And again, we can have and we will have extended conversations about all these details, about how we got here exactly, about how you might feel about these things exactly. But I think it's very difficult to argue that they're members of our community within the states and internationally that are not as highly revered as others. Not just based on race, not just based on class. And when we fail to emphasize, em empathize, when we fail to identify with the other, we miss the mark on what Christ has done for us. We miss the mark on the opportunity to love those that He calls us to love, to serve those that He calls us to serve, to feed those He calls us to feed, to comfort those He calls us to comfort. And again, if we respect the body that we're trying to change, we might soon begin to see Colin Kaepernick as our brother. We might soon begin to see George Zimmerman as our brother, or Betsy Shelby as our brother, Jason Van Dyke and Laquan McDonald as our brother. We might see Hillary Clinton as our sister, Donald Trump as our brother, a Syrian refugee as our brother, a member of ISIS as our sister. If you respect the body you're trying to change, if you say, this is the human condition, and I love it so desperately, I want this relationship to work so desperately, it will dictate my tone, it will dictate my conversation, it will dictate my effort. Now, I don't want to kick off this whole week and say, well, everything sucks. We're screwed, everybody. There's no hope. You know, um, I've been thinking a lot about the definition of hope. Um, not just over these last couple of weeks, but for a while. These last couple of years in particular have been pretty trying for a myriad of reasons. And again, these are not the only matters that weigh us down, the only things that we contend with, right? We all have a whole lot of stuff going on in our lives. We struggle with depression, we struggle with pornography, we struggle with broken relationship with family, we struggle with all these different things. And so I think about what does hope really mean? And I truly believe that part of the beauty of Christ is that he is that hope, he embodies that hope, he calls us to that hope. A hope rooted in extreme love. Someone like he's a love terrorist. A hope rooted in an extreme faith, an extreme trust, that despite all of the chaos, all of the muck, all of the mire that goes on, his blood can clean it all. His love can heal it all. When I look at you, I see hope. As I mentioned before, there's both a biblical and a secular mandate, I would argue the challenge is that the importance of diversity is rooted in relationship, and we all have the opportunity to be in relationship with the world in a way that so many of our peers, so many of our friends, so many of our families will never even understand, much less have the opportunity to participate in. And for us to be able to step into that, to own that, is a call that we have to take advantage of. I look at all of you and I see future global leaders not just those that are going to run Fortune 500 companies, not just those that are going to be the presidents and the diplomats of different countries, not just those that are going to be great statesmen and stateswomen, not just that, but great servants. Because you've taken the time to understand both the history, you've taken the time to understand and empathize, you've taken the time to be hopeful. Not to sit down rooted in fear and despair, not to sit down and be fearful, 
but all the challenges that we have. But to take the time to truly learn about your sister, to listen to your brother, to create a space where they feel safe enough to do that, and to create the consistency and the trust that will continue to build and overflow. We as believers, we know that mandate well. Sometimes we forget it. And hopefully, together, we can do that better. We can live in true relationship. Um, as I mentioned before, today's conversation, the conversation that will follow it, the spaces that will be created after this, it's not just about this particular type of diversity, that's not it. I do want to stress that. Hopefully, this can be an example. Hopefully this path of history, empathy, and hope for both believer and non-believer can be a path that can be applied in your conversations about the world, in your conversations about the country, in your conversations with your family, with your friends, with yourself. And we pray as a faculty, we pray as body believers with your God. Um, I do want to encourage you guys, as I mentioned before, there will be a number of conversations and spaces built. There are already student groups that have conversations about these issues. Please know that this is a school again. We are confident and we step boldly into these conversations because we know the love that we have for each other. And we know the potential to do that even better than we had before. Um, if you'd let me, I'd like to pray. Um, and then we step forward into our next couple days and weeks of the Steinberg experience. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your hope. I thank you that despite the repeated times we fail, that despite the continued and pervasive brokenness, you will always be true, you will always be faithful. I pray, Lord, that as we move forward from this place, as we continue in our relationships with each other and with you, that we will continue to glorify you in all the things that we do, in all the things that we say, and all the ways that we love. I pray this in your son's name. Amen.